Hello and welcome back to Me to Swimming, my friends. This is one of the last or the last episode really on CDTN. So I'm going to be interviewing Dr. Michael Fröhlich and he was really up until a few months ago part of the management team of CDTN. So it's going to be a little bit of a mixed episode. So we're really going to talk through his personal journey and talk about his two PhDs and also what the what the PhDs were all about and kind of the results of it because that's going to be incredibly interesting, especially because it was really about kind of seeing how do these networks work in terms of success or programs really. So his kind of research question broken down is kind of does the CTM work and doing what it's supposed to do, which is you know, empower people to kind of change. And, and you can see that obviously with the startup process, but then we did a scientific research on it and he's going to tell you all about it way, way better than I can. And at the end, we're going to talk a little bit about the CTM and the center and just kind of a lot of nuggets of truth for you there as well. So I'm super hyped for this episode. Let's jump right into this one. So welcome everybody back to Meet us Munich. I'm super glad that we have a special guest today. So Dr. Michael Fröhlich is going to join us today for a session. Uh, thanks so much, Michael, for being here. I'm really happy for this episode. Yeah, Mariana, uh, really happy to also be on the METIS podcast. I really have benefited a lot uh, myself during my studies from student initiatives and the vibrancy and serendipity it gave me beyond my informatics studies. So very happy to support this podcast. Thanks so much. So we're going to get today into so many topics. I mean, from your personal journey, CTM, your research was going to be super interesting. Um, so we're going to start off a little bit kind of I mean people getting to know you in case somebody does not know you so I think what I found really interesting is that at the beginning you did kind of an internship at a strategy consultancy and then you joined the CDTM management team so I think most people at the channel will probably be familiar that's kind of you know everything about the center and just kind of the center assistance and then you pursued a PhD there which I found really interesting because I, I think sometimes people don't have many role models there so I think I'm just interested to find out, and I think the audience as well, like what motivated you to do this journey at the beginning? Yeah, sure. So first of all, it's okay if you don't know me. I think most people don't. But uh, to to jump into your question, I had a bit of a, a use my studies. I originally studied uh, computer science or informatics at TUM, both the bachelor and the master's program there. And I really used my studies to explore different roles. So I did uh, software internships, uh, software engineering and internships, uh, software development, mostly app and web dev. Uh, and then also I did a three-month internship at uh, Roland Berger, uh, the strategy consultancy. And I think one of my main messages that I want to also give uh, to the audience here is that your early 20s are really a great time to explore different roles and careers to figure out not only what you like doing, but also what you're good at. And uh, also this is reflected from my experience in exploring things like strategy consulting, but also then really the core of what I was studying, right? Software development. Um, bring this all together. These are also probably the three reasons that uh, made me choose the position at CDTM's management team when I decided to take on the position in beginning of 2019. So I would argue that there are three main reasons. And I think the truth is always a bit more complex and nuanced, right? So part of me also just wanted to the day a student a little bit longer and not uh, go out there into to real life. I have to say though, a job in the management team very much is a real job, right? But still be a bit more flexible and close to university. So for me, these three main reasons were first, I always had an interest in research. I could always imagine myself doing a doctorate. Um, at the same time, the value proposition that at a typical chair where I would really just be focused on that, wasn't quite capturing me uh, that much in terms of excitement. Then second, I always had an interest in education and really enabling people. I guess I got that from my mom, she's a teacher, and uh, I also volunteered during my studies uh, teaching um, children in school the basics of, of computer science and other stuff like this. And this was also a very um, fulfilling part of, of my life, really giving and enabling people there. And having benefited from the CDTM myself, I was a student in 2016, I felt like this would also be an appropriate place to give back. And finally, the third point is that I wanted to grow as a manager and learn how I lead people in an organization. And to understand that, I think um, during your studies as a computer scientist, as a developer, if you're good, you mostly have an impact through developing things, projects yourself. Even if you work in interdisciplinary teams, you bring this in as your strength. 
And I think what I was lacking also from the perspective of potentially founding a startup was the people management experience. And what I mean by that is how you actually implement projects through leading other people and guiding them while not so much doing the work yourself. And bring this all together, I felt like uh, the CDTM management team was uh, a great mix of these different aspects that made it a very attractive position for me. Awesome. I think there's uh, like some, so many, so I first of all really loved, I think you also, I'm going to talk with um, Aaron as well, like the, the CDTM as yeah. a home, right? And I think uh, that's so nice that when you are still part of the community also as the management team, and then you can see the new generations coming in and then also the part of education, I really love that. Like, um... oh, it, it's so great. It was one of my favorite things. I mean, you kind of see this, you have these students that come in uh, and you, you see them grow, not just during the program, but you also kind of stay in touch after that, right? So uh, the first class that I really, uh, where I owned the course that I was teaching them was in 2019. Now they've gone on to, you know, found startups and uh, take on research position and do all kinds of amazing stuff. And uh, I still remember for many of them, the points where they started, where they struggled with uh, things like, okay, how can I best present this? Can I really do I have the confidence to stand in front of an audience? And with the also pressure, of course, that CDTM as a program, group pressure, right, brings on there. You had some people that really, you know, it was difficult for them. And now they are pitching in front of hundreds of people and are doing all this great stuff. And you see the progression through the program, through the challenges you give them, but also the support. And um, yeah, I think overall, that's that's really fulfilling in the end uh, to to be at, at least a little bit part of the journey of of those students. I love it. I can really see like your your lighting up. <laughs> it's so nice to see. Yeah, um, I mean it's great. I love it. Um, I guess that's that's something which unites us. I have really been very passionate about education myself. So nice to hear. Um, so I think you said like okay, you were a student, and then obviously as a PhD, like maybe like what was one of your highlights of your time at CTM and. I think you said about the special setup, which the PhD at the CDTM is like, who would you kind of recommend that role for? So the role turned out to be a great fit for me. And I went into this with the last question already with why this was the case. Uh, I do really believe for the, for the time where I was, uh, it was the best job I could have in the world, really, for me. And for those interesting, I would also really recommend uh, checking out, I think it's www.ddtm.de slash jobs. And there is also a 30 minute podcast from some of my former colleagues that go a bit into what really the working life uh, as part of the management team looks like. Um, so I won't go into too much detail also because it's rather diverse. So what was my highlight? And I think also because it's so diverse, that's a bit difficult to pinpoint. I think there are several things that I feel grateful for. Uh, I think first there's really this diversity of responsibility and problems I got to deal with. So uh, to be clear, sometimes in the moment, these problems were hard and they were very, very taxing, especially when it comes to people problems where other people are affected, there is no right and wrong. You need to really rely on your own judgment on how to deal with such a situation. And this I felt was very taxing, but also the things I was responsible for and that I could manage from very operational things to very strategic things. Um, that was really a great learning uh, curve in school for learning how to manage, how to take in different uh, experiences, but at the end also on the outcome. Now let's call it developing people skills also. Then I think, and you will hear this probably from many people in the CDTM cosmos and also probably different student initiatives, right? It's not just the CDTM, it's the environment and the people. In terms of CDTM, I think they're all driven and motivated and this really reflects back to you. If you are in such an environment, you also want to achieve things and strive to be better and improve. And um, I just think it's very, it gives me a lot of energy to work in such environments. This includes, of course, the students I got to support through my courses. And I mean, there also there's also a lot I learn from the students I have because they are in different fields. They've also done such amazing things at, at this age that I couldn't have imagined doing back then. Um, but then also really my colleagues, so the CDTM management team is actually 10 uh, people uh, and some of them more senior than me. And then over the time, also new colleagues, I, I got to, to hire and onboard uh, and also help to start on the way. And then the board professors, I think also the relationship to the board professors is a bit different uh, than at a typical chair um, because we have more 
responsibility over the organization and they are there also to support us. But I would argue a bit more on eye level than a typical chair where it's really your boss that uh, that is your professor that supervises you. So the second point, environment and people. And maybe to add on this second point, I think there are general, generally two types of people in your life. Uh, those who constantly positively surprise you, and it comes back to friends, it comes back to also working colleagues that exceed your expectations and you're just like, oh, that's amazing, right? And uh, they keep on doing that. Uh, I mean, doesn't mean every day, but uh, if sometimes they take on tasks and they come back with you and it's just like, wow, that's way better than I thought. And then are those people that generally don't do that. And I think if you look in your life, typically you have those people that constantly do that and then you have others where this doesn't just pop up. And I'm not saying that these are bad people in, in any way, but maybe the way how you interact with them or the topics you interact on, uh, with them are maybe not their passion topics and so forth, right? So, and at CDTM, I feel like for me personally, I had a lot of these experiences where students, but also colleagues uh, that uh, that surprised me, that kept bringing really, really good results uh, back more better than I could do, right? And so this also raises the standards of what you want to expect from the work you put in and what you expect from uh, generally what with other people, what you work with within. And this in the end is also a bit of a privilege because right now, if I think about whom do I actually going to work with? If I am not surprised by the people I start working with, that's a bad sign for me now because I know that there, this can be that much better, right? So uh, yeah, I think that that's the part or one part of the people aspect that definitely was was a highlight for me. Wanted to, I think, highlight for, for the viewers a little bit some of the points you said and set them into context, I think. First off, like if if any of these words which we're talking about, I think when you're deep into it, you know, like the board of professors, um, you know, they may seem like, okay, what is this? Then definitely you can check out the video um, on the CDTM. But then I also like the fact that you say the energy, how do people show up every day? And I, I think if you look at the videos, like also when I talked with Aaron, he was saying, you know, these people, every Centrelink brings in something new and this energy. And I think that if you can, take that away and from your working environment, that's gonna be so motivational because you come in and people have this, they wanna drive something forward. And I think there's always, as you said, somebody who does more things, but I feel like if you look at it more from a motivational perspective, that you can achieve more things and that's a great outcome. Yeah, I totally agree. Don't we all want to be in an environment that where you know you feel like people, things are moving, things are changing and they're doing so for the better. And uh, the people you work most closely with in your everyday life, I think they have a, uh, a big impact on how you actually perceive the world around you and yeah so i think you had a second question right so who is this the right job for exactly yeah who who should apply so, people who bring energy into the room to keep on the topic uh no but i think uh right so first thing is uh you listen to this podcast, you look at our homepage and you just feel like, hey, this could be the right place for me. Or at least your interest is intrigued and you start coming to, let's say, Inspire and Dine events to understand a bit more. Because I think these podcasts are really great um, or also other formats like the website, right? To get a first initial understanding. But then a lot is talk to the people there and both the students, but also the management team. Uh, we're very open for that. Just approach us on LinkedIn or uh, at one of our events, um, even if, if there's no recruiting phase, right? So, but you might be interested in the future, so reach out. Uh, and I think then I would say you should bring an interest in management, education, and research. I think these are the jobs you're in the end doing. It's a management job. You're dealing a lot with handling projects, handling people. You will be responsible for uh, part of the education at CDTM uh, together also with colleagues, but there should be also, you know, a bit of a... Uh, an interest in that and finally re research so here we are rather open but uh and that's an advantage of this position that you can actually bring in and and figure out on your own which topic you want to research uh, on and compared to a typical position at a at a chair at university uh, these are less pre-assigned but really you can bring your own topic you still need to find a professor that supervises you and so forth but your financing at least is not dependent on that i think um in addition to this interest you want to be very comfortable working in a highly dynamic environment. This means you will be driving different projects at once. And it really sometimes feels like juggling and keeping a lot of balls afloat. Um, and you don't have a lot of time to go into these projects. And it's part of the management aspect I would expect. 
so you need to be able to keep uh, all these different trains trains of thought uh, moving and and uh, keep an overview. And maybe this also to add there, right? So you need to be good to deal with underspecified problems. One, and what I mean by that is that nobody at CDTM will come here and give you a well-defined problem, but rather it will be something like, for example, one grant project I was responsible when I started in 2019 was to organize an entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial food summer school uh, together with a university in Israel for 30 people. Now, at that point, I'd never taught a course at CDTM. Uh, I had access to all the resources and could ask all the colleagues. I've now organized a summer school, of course. And so I got to sit down and figured it out. And I looked at, okay, how are other summer schools organized? Um, all the courses internally organized? How could I struct restructure this into a two-week program? And so really organize the summer school is the task, very underspecified. And then you need to be able to work backwards to really a plan on how to implement this and, and be comfortable with this situation. And I think to achieve all of this, the third point, uh, I would also say we need smart people. We need snappy people, fast thinkers that have also the drive to bring this into action. Because I think if you're more uh, somebody who likes to theorize about the problem and plan it from beginning to end before you implement something, then maybe this is not the right position for you. Because while it requires you to quickly spring into action and work maybe with uh, just the classical 80-20 principles, uh, principle that brings you forward faster and allows you to learn more about the problem you're trying to solve. Because in truth, you probably don't have the time to properly deconstruct and understand everything you're doing day to day. I love that. I think, well, first off, I, I really like that you're open and saying like people can approach you because sometimes I feel like, I mean, the CDTM is quite well known and people are like, oh, I don't know, if, how are these people? Like, can I approach them? I really like that. But then second on, on to who would thrive into this. I also think, you know, this is kind of almost like when you start your own company, you can't do everything perfect, but you have to take ownership and you have to drive yeah. your profits and you see how it's going and then you get feedback and then you, but you need to work fast. And, and I, I love that. I think that's something which a lot of people is probably not going to be the job, but if you enjoy that and then you can do research, I mean, that sounds like a really good combination. Yeah, it's, uh, as I said, I love it's the best job. And as you said, it's not the job for everyone. I think that's also something that's important to convey that uh, it's better to find something that has a very good fit to what and who you want to be. Maybe you are not there, right? But you see the path to, to getting there. Uh, as opposed to something where you are just know that you will have a much harder time because it's not that fun for you and it doesn't fit you that well. Um, yeah, so this is the people we're look at, looking at uh, for CDTM. And as you said, please approach us need for any position. and But do your homework before that, right? So I uh, once had a call from... Uh, somebody who was already in the second stage of the the process for the management team, and he was he got an email where all the questions were in that he asked me, and that that's just annoying if you don't spend time re-explaining these things. So I think uh, uh, approach us, but you know don't approach us uh, with, with questions that you can also easily find by typing them into Google. Yeah, I think I think that shows preparation and also like that you yeah. you care because I mean everybody's busy and anything. If you prepare and you're like, okay, I really thought this through and I have some deeper questions and that's, I mean, that's just value that you are, you're conveying at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I scrolled a little bit through your LinkedIn. I do that with every guest. and uh, oh, I, All the stalkers. No, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I admit I'm, I'm the LinkedIn stalker only for the guests though. Um, so I found it really interesting. You had like one post, which was um, on the value of integrity and good character. And I love that. I thought that was um, super interesting. And, I, and my question is kind of what makes for you good character? Yeah, so I, I experimented a bit with also LinkedIn on how to, to use the platform for myself. And that was, that's what, this was actually one of the genuine posts where I was, um, I observed the situation that just very starkly reminded me of that, where, uh, and that prompted me to, to make this post. So this was less planned and probably as you scroll through it, it was in terms of the type of post, one of the few there. But uh, uh, I think it's a very important lesson. I think the small things matter more than you think. Are you a person that, for example, brings energy into the room or rather takes it away? Same in a meeting, right? So are you easy to work with or difficult to work with? Do you stand by your mistakes and actually try to fix them when things go wrong? Or do you argue 
whose fault this really was that we are now in this situation. And I think these are just a few dimensions. And uh, in the end, we need to recognize that the relationships with the people we work with, or really any relationship in life, right? It's an infinite game. It's a long-term perspective you need to adopt. And uh, people who sacrifice character or their integrity in the short ter term for personal gains, taking a little shortcut, you know, but you know that uh, people will not perceive this as fair and so on, then the end will lose in the long term because that's your reputations. It will affect your relationship. And it doesn't mean that sometimes breaking the rules to a certain extent isn't allowed or even beneficial, but uh, there are certain things that signal that you don't respect. And this is being integrity, the, the values that you communicate and you, you uh, actually are willing to sacrifice them for an, uh, the means and the, uh, the outcome in the end you want to have. And uh, I think there's also a great Warren Buffett quote on that. Uh, he said, it takes 20 years to build reputation and five minutes to ruin it. So uh, my point is here, really think about what values you hold dear and probably also the people around you and act in accordance to them. I think that's that's something which I would... No, I think it's... it's... It's nice when people relate you to to topics when when you know okay this is a person who I can really work with and and if that is not I think I I, I remember on another quote from Maya Angelou like it was about like what do people when they think about you what do they say and if it's not so pleasant things maybe you need to rethink how you show up every day so I think it's definitely very true. So yeah, yeah. but also take into consideration right who are you asking I think that's that's yeah, the yeah, second 100%. point. It's like uh, with feedback, right? I mean, not everything you need to take on, obviously. Yeah, exactly. And then I think also surround yourself with people that rather they talk behind your back, right? But they they give you compliments behind your back to other people and they make the cake bigger for, for the people around them rather than taking away by gossiping or trying to capitalize on mistakes that, that other people made. 100%. That's just negative energy, which doesn't help anybody, really. Um, exactly. There's nothing to gain. <laughs> <laughs> agree, agree. Um, so, okay. So, people have a bit of a field for, for I think, for who you are. So, I think that's a good uh, place to start. And and I said, we're going to go a little bit into your research and your PhD. So, I think people might be surprised to hear that, I mean, you did two PhDs. So, one on human-computer interaction. And one with uh, Professor Isabel Welpe, who's also part of the, um, the CDTM ecosystem. And it was a lot about the CDTM kind of, and it won also some several awards for that paper. So I think first of like, what would you say is one of the misconceptions on research? And, and maybe let's just talk a little bit about what, what was the process like for you? Yeah, so uh, first off, yes, I did that. Uh, and to be clear on the status, I have one doctor and the other one is still in evaluation, so I don't have the, the second one yet. But I want to highlight that in many ways, I was very, very lucky that it turned out the way. And uh, I had really great people around me supporting me, be it the students I worked with as part of some of these projects, other collaborators, co-authors, uh, mentors and advisors. And also in terms of timing, I was, I was lucky that it worked out in the end. And without all of them, first of this wouldn't have been possible. And I'm just super immense, grateful for, for all of them being part of my life on this uh, professional side. And I think the second one is doing a doctorate, a single doctorate, right? Uh, it's a difficult task. And I don't think that there are any two that are the same. Uh, so the marginal benefits of doing a second one, and I'm saying this, are definitely not worth the effort. I'm not thinking that I really gained anything about or for, for having now this, uh, or potentially having, uh, to be clear, that this second title. I think. For me, it was really the question that motivated it for the second one. Do programs like CDTM or Manage More actually work, right? So that's kind of one of the bubble I was moving in. And there's really not a lot of good research that tries to answer this question with these kinds of programs. Um, I think there's generally not that much uh, good research that evaluates entrepreneurship education at university, but that's also something I found out along the process. So that really motivated motivated me to take on the dissertation. I was at that point, uh, that was the first Corona summer in 2020, at a point where the my first project was going quite well. I had written three papers. And so uh, I was just also curious to take on this project. And by also convincing uh, then Professor Isabel Welpe to supervise me, 
I thought that if I could not really put this into a proper study and properly evaluate it, I could also somewhat uh, on the one hand benefit personally from it, of course, with the second title, but then on the other hand, also have the external motivation to actually do it properly, right? So it's so easy to just deprioritize it if it's not really in, in this larger, developed in this larger goal. And uh, this is how this all came to be. Awesome. I think what I really like is the fact that you said there are other people involved, like other co-authors. And I feel personally, before I started doing research at the film, I had the idea that it was like you and your little paper and you're on your own. And I think when you realize how much of a group effort this actually is just to the iterations and then going and, and publishing that paper, I think that's, that's super rewarding when you have different perspectives and you work actually in a team together on it. Yeah, and not enough people embrace this teamwork aspect, I think. Um, and yeah, I think also coming from the CDTM and then also um, experience a bit the computer science side, but also the management side really allowed me to have this strong internal conviction also to push always to work with other people for pure mo motivational reasons. And then also, uh, as I said, if you have people around you that constantly surprise you positively, then be sure that what you do together is probably better than what you alone will be able to achieve. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, so I think what, what I find really interesting, I mean, those topics were quite different in terms of like what your focus was. So what would you kind of recommend to aspiring researchers? Is there something you, you would uh, like to impart? Yeah. So if you want to do a management, uh, PhD, right, don't start with the computer science one. Uh, they are quite differently and, and that's definitely true, though. I think there are underlying principles that how you think about research and how you approach it, that I just there's a common ground through to it. And I think I, uh, in total took a bit more than four years for both now of them now. And the second one, I had an effective working time on it of maybe a bit more, more than two years, right? So a lot shorter. And I think the dissertation in the end turned out better. Um, so I think there is a certain transfer knowledge, uh, that, that you can apply there, though. I think that's not really the way to go. I can recommend though anyone uh, in their discipline, first of all, get started with your project, right? But then also try to collaborate with people from other fields. I think there's a lot of benefit to seeing how they think about research. And you might get all of this with a research project or a paper that doesn't fit your dissertation or so, but I think the collaboration itself and also understanding how really other disciplines think about research and what are valuable contributions. And it's actually quite different across fields, right? So quite, quite different. Uh, it, it's very interesting. Um, yeah, uh, what else to say? I think for anyone who thinks or considers doing a PhD or also PhDs at the beginning of their research career, I think one big, big misconception that you need to get out of, of the way is that research is not a practice or let's reverse it. I'm saying research is a practice. It's a very practical thing to do. Yes, you have to theorize and understand the field first. What's what's the problem you're trying to solve? What is known about this problem already? What's your conceptual understanding of the problem, right? But then a lot of it is actually getting out there, collecting data uh, as fast as possible. And this is very practical. And you cannot learn how to do research by going into seminars and then having a professor tell you how the typical paper is structured or how you would approach research. Right, learn this, read, read through this, but then design your uh, study, right? Design it yourself, get out there and make your, uh, make your hands dirty in, in a sense and collect your first data. And um, yeah, I think this is really the, the first thing I would recommend them to do because coming back to more this iterative approach, you will need to iterate. The first study you're gonna design, you, you're designing and the first paper you write, it's gonna suck most likely. Or it's maybe it's not gonna suck, right? But it's not gonna be the best work because everything you do with practice, it gets better. So before you really plan the one study that makes up your PhD in the end, try to kind of test it. Do a first study, get back some data and see whether what you want to do actually works. And I think what most people don't realize that this threshold, where just theorizing and planning more, doesn't give you marginal benefits anymore is reached far faster than you think so read your paper plan your study yes discuss it with your professor in a few iterations but then really push for getting real data 
And once you have it, try to analyze and try to see whether the effect that you want to see is there. Or maybe you have too many uh, variables, too much variance in them. You need to, to have a refined experiment. Maybe you don't actually get the response rates you expected. And this would mean that your bigger study that you would otherwise have done in two years would actually fail. So a lot of this preliminary data can really, really help you to hone in and improve your studies design or also for other studies uh, moving forwards. And I think don't be afraid to make mistakes in this early stages. That's very, very, these make, mistakes are very, very important to, to drive you forward. Rather make them as fast as possible. Um, yeah, so that's the, the first one, I guess. Uh, I think the other one is collaboration. So collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Um, you can leverage your own time through collaboration with, um, let's say, students in master thesis or IDP or working with, with other um, researchers, uh, with other PhDs or postdocs. And uh, you really want to compound the time you actually putting in to get more work done. And one part of this is by starting a lot of projects at the same time or in parallel. So at times I was supervising between five and, and, and 10 master theses, not all on the same topic, of course, but in different spaces I found interesting. Some of them really extended what I was doing in my either one uh, research project or dissertation, but others were very much focused on them, either trying to help me collect data, trying to test different ideas I had at that point that I thought, hey, this could be really interesting, but I didn't quite know and I didn't have the time to do it myself. But for example, this could be one way how you test whether a research setup actually works by uh, giving it out to a master's students, having them basically collect the data from an adjacent sample and so forth. And in the end, by parallelizing this, you realize a lot of dead ends, <laughs> of course, uh, earlier, but you also get some new ideas and some of the projects I now have in my dissertation that turned out as something I would just thought like this could be interested, interesting, but I didn't want to take it into my dissertation. But in the end, it turned out to be a way, way better idea than I had expected. And then I took this, refined it, and then did it again and so forth. And I think collaboration is super helpful here. Uh, but you also need to combine this with a strong focus on killing projects that don't work, right? So if you start 10 things, you don't have the time to actually bring 10 things to the end. So it allows you in the end to focus on the three projects that worked really well and that, that are the eight nine, 10 on a scale from, from uh, one to 10, right? In terms of quality. And you can actually use them and turn them into publications versus uh, killing everything that's a seven or, or less. And that's also a mental model. Basically don't do sevens, uh, which in my head means sevens are uh, the things that actually have the potential. If you now put a lot of work in, this could actually work out and you just need to write the paper nicely, right? So don't do them. That's wasted time. Rather, if you have the the possibility to explore more and refine this, uh, kill all the sevens that might have the potential, but in the end will cost you so much time in the review process and in writing the paper, rather focus on the winners. Yeah, and um, I think maybe as a th third tip, and uh, sorry for making this a very long answer here, uh, kill your idealism. Um, at least from the CDTM perspective in the management team, you get to choose whatever PhD topic you want to do, right? So people start at CDTM in the management team and then they go on this soul searching mission on, okay, what big quest question do they want to answer and contribute? And this goes on and on and on. It's a bit like, I think, do figure that out for yourself in which field you want to be and to which topic you want to contribute. But uh, I think once you have that, try to move into action as fast as possible. And part of this is that it's probably a more fruitful approach to find the smartest person in this field. Um, who has uh, worked there, who has published the papers that are most relevant, and then talk to them and understand what do they see as the really big issues in the field and try to really just uh, listen to them. And uh, instead of trying to come up with this perfect project you want to do and you want to have come up with the original idea and then with the study design and so forth, so rather try to shortcut this by really talking to people that understand what are the unsolved and important issues there and then move on from there. And in the end, the paper you'll need to write anyways yourself. And I think uh, all along the way, this project will change a bit and, and so forth, but there's really a lot of value in leveraging experiences already out there. Thanks so much for providing these insights. I 
when I listened to you, I, I was almost reminded to startups, like just kind of getting the, yeah. the interviews and, and, and then also killing off the projects, which doesn't work um, just in a to kind of stay flexible in research as well. And, and also in terms of the collaboration, I think if, if we look back, I mean, a couple centuries ago, I mean, the, some of the greatest minds were doing different fields. And I think there is also a great value in kind of looking interdisciplinarily because as you said, they have different thinking and you can probably take something from, from each field if you talk with people. So I really like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, and research is amazing or can be amazing. So that's also maybe something to convey here. Uh, especially if you have control about the environment and who you do it with and so forth. Awesome. So let's focus a little bit on your study and, and, and what you did during your research. So um, especially the second one, I think is very interesting um, to kind of the audience. And you said that you were like kind of looking at, at, at programs like CGTM or Manage More and kind of how they affect the individuals and kind of their willingness and their success in founding. So I'm just going to give you the word in terms of what you want to share, your main findings, and just kind of uh, what motivated this all. Yeah, thank you. I'm um, taking a sip from my Späti here to also prepare the long answer I'm going to give. So uh, we have around now in the latest batch 400 applications for these 25 bots. So very competitive to get in. Um, and I'm sure that there is other people in these 400 that don't get in that are as good, uh, they would have deserved this spot uh, as well as those 25, but for those say rather random reasons, maybe they um, they couldn't prepare as long. They had heard about the program uh, just shortly before the application deadline and they didn't have so much time to prepare. Or let's say they uh, had, uh, had a bad day the day before the interview and this changed the performance there. So a lot of reasons, I think, why there are more than 25 talented students in Munich. Um, Alumni of CDTM, they founded some of the most successful growth startups in Munich. Um, for example, Personio, Porto, Trade Republic, Fedora. And I think there's a long tail of less known, but also highly successful companies. Uh, however, if you want to answer with now programs like CDTM or Manage More or Start Munich, or let's say also Austrian Startups has a program that's called, I think, the Entrepreneurial Leadership Program. Or if you look outside of the university context, uh, things like Sigma Squared Society, which is think for founders under 26. Well, if you want to see whether they actually work in increasing founder rates or in the founders actually founding more successful startups, you need to consider that these are two things, right? So first of all, they're actively selected. We try to get the best students who apply into the program and then also before that, even you need to figure out how to deal with self-selection because if you just compare them to just all TUM students, let's say, a lot of them are just not interested in entrepreneurship and that's completely fine, right? But those wouldn't found or you wouldn't expect them to found startups anyways. So the question here really is, are these founders successful that come out of CDTM or manage more because they went through the program or because these programs were just very good at selecting the road? Entrepreneur. And that's not a trivial question to answer. Uh, and this my motivation really was from an internal perspective. Uh, if you went through CDTM and also are in this Munich entrepreneurship bubble, you count the startups, uh, the unicorns that come out of university or do all this stuff. And you find a lot of CDTM co-founders there. But really, just by doing that, you can't answer this question. Is it selection or is it actually the program working? Um, and to do that, I had to address first the self-selection issue, then this issue of active selection uh, and so forth. And I used a research design that's called regression discontinuity design or short RDD that allows me to control for all these issues. Particularly what's important there is that we have a rank at the time of application where I can uh, basically control for the quote unquote observed quality in applicants at the point where we selected them. So if I say quality of applicants, I don't really mean that the people that get in are better than those that in the end, for some reasons, don't get in. Uh, I think the, the important thing here is just that we think or the interview uh, score in the end or the rank in the interview uh, to a certain extent codifies how the people in the end who selected this class thought about the quality uh, in terms of their, their the merit to get into the program. Um, and this quasi experimental design really allows me to answer this question and uh, compare career decisions of 
students who were almost accepted into the program, but just a little bit was missing, those who were accepted to the program. And I'm particularly looking at all the uh, uh, applicants for CDTM between 2011 and 2020 in my group. So this is 10 years or 10 cohorts of uh, people applying at CDTM. Awesome. Um, so thanks so much for providing a little bit um, of the insights kind of, I, I really like also the, how you design it in terms that you, first off, the, I, that's something I always tell people that you shouldn't be super deterred when you don't get in. Like, I mean, of course it would have been great, but there are so many people who are, who are, who are actually applying several times. And, and, and if you can also compare that between people where it was just so narrow and, and just kind of see what you can take away from that. So I really like that. Um, so yeah, so kind of maybe you can talk us a little bit through your main findings and maybe what what surprised you. So I'm going to give over to you again. <laughs> yeah, th thanks, Mariana, also for the intro. Yeah, and also for everyone who applies to the program. Um, that's exactly the thing. I think the margins uh, of getting in and it's, it's very competitive and it's very, these margins are very thin. So I think definitely uh, try to find ways to improve for the next time, ask for feedback and so forth. and. Um, and uh, yeah, do your best and uh, eventually it, it will work, hopefully. So what were my main findings of the study? Also as a disclaimer, it's still unpublished research. So uh, this still has to go under undergo peer review process uh, and also my dissertation needs to be graded. That, uh, that said, I still feel very confident about uh, the research I've done and the results there. Um, generally in very simple terms, uh, Participating in CDTM increases your chance of uh, actually after your studies founding a startup, and it does so by almost a factor of two, so or a factor of one hundred percent. So, being um, a student at CDTM within the program, you're twice as likely to found after that. That doesn't mean right after your your studies, but as I said, I looked at everyone who applied from two thousand eleven to twenty twenty. Uh, and collected this data from all the LinkedIn profiles in 2022. Um, this doesn't mean that all CDTM students or alumni found. I think uh, for CDTM, it's about uh, in the sample 36 percent uh, at 36 or 38. Um, now, don't show me this by heart, but uh, rather right around this ballpark of people actually found post graduation. Now, I also looked at the quality of startups they found and. I had to use certain proxies there, but since I'm interested in special growth companies, I looked at the uh, amount of funding they collected. Uh, for example, the VC fund, uh, funding they, they raised. I also looked at survival rates. So do these companies still exist? And uh, then also how many employees they have, so how many people they employ and how many jobs they created. And along all of them, uh, the group of startups founded by CDTM alumni is doing way way better than uh, the comparison group. I mean, I think two times more is uh, insane. <laughs> I think that is actually that is pretty insane. And uh, I think there's the research out there is still sparse. But for all the other research that looked into entrepreneurship programs, the typical effect that was observed for them uh, was that uh, they do actually increase startup quality. And there has been a prominent Stanford study who looked at all the STVP programs. Mm -hmm. uh, that were introduced in the 90s. And it actually shows that uh, also they increased the quality of startups being founded, but uh, they decreased the likelihood or the amount of people that actually do found. Oh. And that's rather interesting. So there's a certain, and you, interesting, this is also seen in accelerator and incubator programs. So if you look at incubators in general, um, and there are some outliers to that also interestingly, uh, incubator programs in general, they tend to have uh, startups fail faster. So it's rather that uh, those that don't have the uh, potential quit. And so those that remain are more successful. Um, and uh, I think Learner 2013, they are one of the strongest studies also in terms of the identification strategy. So the 2021 Easley paper, it does a difference in difference approach where you could argue that you have a lot of exogenous influence. So just in terms of the research design, uh, the results are a bit less to be trusted, let's put it that. But uh, Learner 2013, they looked at MBA programs. Um, so not specific entrepreneurship programs, but they looked into entrepreneurship classes within an entrepreneurship program. And what they also found is that in classes where there were 
uh, MBA students who had formerly founded companies, less people would actually found startups afterwards. But those startups founded in, from students in these classes would be more successful. So kind of the same effect. Now CDTM, uh, and I would also expect similar results if you look at, let's say, Manage More, these experiential add-on programs kind of the type. So where you have this strong selection, self-selection effect that you actually really think you would benefit from doing an additional 45 ECTS next to your main study program, right? So this is already a strong self-selection that's happening there. And then we get to pick the most uh, uh, suited, the most entrepreneurial in terms of their personality from them. Uh, both leads, I think, to an environment that really drives those results and that uh, these are really programs that manage to increase the likelihood that people found and do so with quality. Terrific. Thanks for, for providing so many many insights. Um, so kind of to, to close uh, this topic, I would have um, two shorter questions for you. So I think to the research, I think you gave like a very good overview on the kind of main findings. So first question would be kind of what surprised you? And then the second one would be, you know, a lot of students might think, okay, maybe I didn't get into CDTM or, or I don't know. I think it, it comes off very clear that if you can get in, then it's probably going to increase your chances. But kind of um, what would you recommend a, a student kind of based on, on what you've done so far and your experience and research? Okay, let's start with the first question and maybe close also the research topic a bit there. Um, what surprised me about uh, the findings I have, I think, uh, just looking at the other literature is that it very clearly shows that it works, these kind of programs. Uh, and I think that also more coming back to this rather complicated method I described in the beginning, that what I see is mainly treatment effects. So it kind of speaks to the fact that there's a lot of great people out there and some of them don't get into CT10, but they also go on to do great things. Uh, but at the point of selection, we really can't tell. And this speaks especially for, uh, I think for, the quality of startups to a certain degree, I think there is a, a bit of selection in there, uh, but for um, for the who founds and who doesn't found, the original interview ranking, it has near to none effect on that. And even if I look at the groups, uh, people that come, that get in, the people that don't get in and just look within these groups, whether the rankings are somewhat relevant, who founds or who doesn't, it's not at all the case. And I think that's part of, also the selection process at CDTM that we are not looking for the people who are going to found as soon as possible, but rather general entrepreneurial um, mindset and, and, and skills that also extend to founding companies, right? Uh, so that was very interesting. And then if we talk about why does the entire thing work, um, I did several secondary analysis. So these are less uh, strict in what they find, but more explorative and trying to explain the effect why it works. I think uh, what was surprising, kind of surprising, I would say there, that most of the effect we see is probably through uh, social capital development, developed through the program. And what this basically means is that the skills you can learn uh, at CDTM, how to evaluate the business idea, how to write the business plan, or how to pitch, these things you really can also learn in other places, and they are not the differentiating factor, but rather the community you get, the friends you make, the common minds that you build and how you learn to work on this project and probably to a degree also the network with which you leave then the program. Um, and this coming back to what I would recommend, uh, probably some of the listeners of this podcast speaks for the value that student initiatives can also provide to you in this entrepreneurial context, but probably also in a lot of different contexts. This is why student initiatives or programs like CDTM the benefit they can offer over a single course where you learn a certain skill is that you there you can build the network, get friends and so forth that will continue to provide value over the end of your studies. Thanks so much for, for providing our listeners a little bit of an, an insights there as well. Um, I really like the part of the social capital as well. I think that's something I'm always uh, always saying that I think that that brings you forward in a lot of sense. And I think you also did like this um, look into your CDTM, how much did they raise? We talked a little bit about like venture capital. And uh, as I understand it, you raised over 10% of total venture capital in Germany in 2022. And- Yeah, that's crazy. That's, so, that's, uh, not, that's not, not me, that. not me, not CDTM, <laughs> but the startups alumni. founded by, uh, by, by those alumni, right? <laughs> exactly, no, yes. Uh, it would be very impressive if it was just you, um, but- uh, <laughs> 
So basically, um, my question is, and I think that probably relates back to the social capital, but still just kind of for purpose of, of being very clear, what would you say makes the CDTM so, so unique? So how is that possible? Well, I think to a certain extent that we were early, right? So these types of programs uh, in terms of funding, we were the first uh, study program in the elite network of Bavaria uh, that was funded in 2004. And CDTM existed for five years before that, and we were trying to figure out our own thing, right? And still, I would say, if you look at things like these add-on type study programs, there are not too many around. So, uh, and to a degree, if probably uh, there was an alternative program founded at the same time, and we've managed more, we have a good example that's, I think, comparably uh, successful. Uh, we're competing basically for the right people. And Munich is big enough for two programs. Uh, so I think that's not, not the issue. So the secret sauce there really lies in the people. And this is for on the professor who realized that, well, their support at CityTem is needed rather from a distance and not from up close. Uh, the management team, which is basically doctor students that are not so far away that, you know, still party and uh, understand how this was as students and provide also the, the buffer between maybe professors and being able to do that in buildings that are owned by the university. Then you have the students, and I think this is really big, big part of CDTM, that we don't see education anywhere as you as a student come there and then your education gets put on top of you and then you leave with more than you knew right but rather cdtm is really this kind of student driven organization where the students that come in from day one we expect them to own parts of the organization and this also comes of course with uh, not just the responsibility but also certain flexibility and the possibility to shape the program and change it in uh i think not the big strategic ways, right? That gets more difficult the more people are involved, but uh, still in very, very meaningful ways to them. And I think this all leads to, yeah, I think this all leads to our organization slowly moving forward because of all the positive energy these new uh, people always bring in. And in the end, this builds a culture where everyone within CDTM feels very emotionally connected to the program it's their program and uh, at the same time they understand that if they try to give and provide and help people in this community this will come back to them and uh, so by helping out by being an active member of, of the community without the need really you don't need to do this to keep access to your email right but it's purely voluntary but uh, it's a culture where people have to do so they make the cake bigger for everyone. And eventually this will also mean that they in some way in the future will probably benefit from that. Yeah, I, I, I like so many aspects of that. First off, like that you take the initiative. I mean, you guys have the mostly awesome podcasts and, and, and the climate club and so many other things which are really student driven. And I think that shows to, to, to the fact that, that it's driven by themselves and, and it's providing value to other people. And I, I really like that. And then also just kind of to say that about the, the programs, the two, I think it's super nice that you can kind of see that we are doing now programs also together, like um, entrepreneurial masterclass with Manage More, with CDTM, because at the end of the day, like those are all motivated students who want to do something and want to shape. And and I think it just brings us all more forward as, as a whole, if, if, if it works together. And it's always nice to see like cross-disciplinary teams forming. Um, so yeah, just wanted to say. Yeah, I can only second that. <laughs> So um, from your perspective, I mean, uh, you had so many centerlings who you kind of, um, you know, had the, to work with and, 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 and really have the opportunity there. So I think something which I find interesting is they all come from different backgrounds. So you said, um, so what would be something which most centerlings have in common? Like, I would be interested to hear that. Okay, let me answer this rather, uh, rather, rather on abstract level first. I think CDTM core values, uh, we three are trust and respect, challenge and support, and change and take responsibility. And if you just think about them, what they mean and also how they would be reflected in behavior, you get a pretty good answer of a common denominator that's present in CDTM students. I think they are ambitious, they want to challenge the status quo, right? Uh, but also they understand that they can achieve more if they support each other in a team, right? Uh, or if they ask for help, they are supportive in this way, but then also in very candid, in challenging 
each other to find better solution. Uh, they understand for that to happen, right? It's way easier to receive harsh feedback if you know that it comes, if you trust that it comes from a place of understanding and the other person wants to make your idea better. So this trust and respect really is the, the foundation for all of that. And then they're also proactive to address problems they see. They call them out, they try to fix them. They want to change the environment about them and take responsibility. And in all that, uh, also, I would say, humble enough that they also realize this, that as their environment and so on changes, they also have to change uh, and, and improve and maybe um, take on new perspectives from, from time to time. And you know, this shouldn't really be an ad campaign, but I think that's, uh, that's a pretty good denominator for what you find in, in uh, the students and generally all people at CDTM. And to be fair, we don't live up to these values all the time. And I think uh, from time to time, I for myself can, can be pretty arrogant if I, if I don't uh, pay attention and, and not be humble and maybe not extend trust first. But I think uh, these are the values that we strive uh, to, to uh, reach and uh, how we strive to act. And I hope that more often than not, we can actually live up to them. I think striving and already doing your best is, is more than a lot of people do. So I think that's already a good place to start. And um, so I like the, 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 the core values and how you related that to the abstract part. It's a good way to start. I think um, something which might also be interesting to hear from, I mean, I, I'm sure you saw a lot of applications during your time. It's kind of who would be the ideal applicant? Like um, what would be your, your position there? Yeah, I think there's luckily I don't have the you know perfect checklist and uh, a prototype of that. Maybe you could ask ChatGPT for that. But uh, I think right, be, be yourself. And I think that's also something I the the best applicants every time it was things that surprised in the end that didn't fit into any roster, but still people that uh, yeah that brought along a lot of the the things the common things I I, I said about and then still had their own unique personality and so forth and. Um, that's that's the short answer. Though uh, I I want to you know give this question back to you at this end. You have seen a lot of Unix different initiatives and interviewed them. So I want to know from you now how would you expect the perfect CDTM or the ideal CDTM applicant to be? That's a a very good question. Um, so I think something which I I would abstract from most student initiatives is is what we talked about before, like kind of the taking the ownership. Um, driving your own projects forward and being curious and, and just kind of being able to engage into these networks because you have so many opportunities to do things that you can kind of, you know, really engage in those and, and whether that's CDTM or a student initiative or start, I mean, there are so many really. But I think what is what I'm trying to convey also on the channel and maybe for future CDTM applicants as well is to kind of look at the nuances between the programs. So, I mean, if you look at Start Munich, it's mostly about the, the network and then like engaging, going to events, uh, manage more has a bit of a different structure because uh, to CTM, just because the trend seminar is like you work really on that and then you do the managing product development. So I would encourage kind of, I would expect the ideal CDTM applicant to have really gone thoroughly through all these programs and seen, hey, I really like the structure here and, and I, I can get behind that. And going, as you said, the extra mile in terms of like going to these events, talking to people inspired then, I think I would expect that from an ideal applicant, hopefully. Yeah, I think uh, two very, very important points or probably more than two very important points, but uh, I think uh, overall find your the right tribe for yourself. I think that's very important and uh, that's going to this these events where you can engage with the different people in, in these different initiatives. and also listen to your gut feeling with which ones do you vibe where you, do you think that this sounds actually really interesting and you're excited about this i think these are very good uh, signposts for for yourself to if you're struggling to decide in which direction you want to go um yeah maybe to add uh, one thing to that on a more practical level also how people can i guess increase their chances if they apply that they would be a good fit to cdtm i think i talked about the core values and that's definitely a part of that and that's also something that should be reflected in your past uh past cv and the past projects you did right so if you if you say you're a proactive person who sees problems and addresses them what are projects what are things in the past where you did them i think just saying it 
actions uh, speak louder than words, right? But uh, I think another thing how you can think about this is this concept of T-shaped skills and interests. So just imagine a, a T. Uh, and we look for this in these technology and innovation domains. What does this exactly mean? It brings that you basically bring a deep functional expertise in one area. For example, in computer science, this could be machine learning or uh, web development or software engineering. And there you did a few projects already and you would actually feel comfortable to taking the lead in that specific area in an inter interdisciplinary team. Uh, if you look at uh, now more management studies, uh, this could be, let's say, finance as a core strength. You have really good at uh, at creating financial models in Excel, or evaluating um, business ideas and, and shaping pitches and so forth. And there's probably a lot of different specific skills or di different disciplines like psychology or so that are, are valuable in teams, right? So uh, it's not so much about fitting the perfect CDTM uh, thing here, but you want to find people who have these key, this deep dimension in uh, what they bring from their study background in essence. But then you also want to have this broad, the top of the T, this broad uh, cross-functional interest and ex expertise. And that doesn't mean that along everything that tech, that's technology and innovation, you are a fanboy of everything that's there, uh, but you have this broad interest and you think technology is interesting and also how innovation works, maybe in startups, but also maybe in corporates. Who knows what's your, your specific niche, but you have this broad ability to find interesting stuff uh, there and maybe you did a few projects that expanded what you were doing in your studies in this area. And I think this is important because in the end, our understanding of what it means to work in interdisciplinary teams means that you exactly bring in the parts where you are really strong, where you have strength, uh, and you do this with people from different disciplines, and suddenly you have a team that can achieve a lot because they have a lot of deep experience, but also they have the broad understanding so that they communicate and create a common language across all these different disciplines to effectively work together. Oh, I, I love that T. I had never heard of that concept before. So thanks so much for introducing it, Michael. That's a, a very interesting one to, to keep in mind. To, to kind of close off the, the CDTM uh, chapter and now with applications, obviously, also for, for this intake. Um, I think some people, when they don't know anybody from, from CDTM, they're like, oh, uh, 400 applications, should I really do this? Like, any tips or anything you could kind of share with somebody who might be thinking? <laughs> Uh, what do you have to lose from applying? Uh, I, I want to be be, uh, be clear here, right? It's it's difficult to get in there, but be somebody who sets big, bold goals and works towards reaching them. And you might fail along the way, but you might also learn a lot and push a lot. So um, I think so So two, two things in terms of tips. First of all, I feel like this technology management study program offered by CDTM, it sounds very technical, but... And there are definitely some techies in there that are very technical, right? But in the end, it's about this interdisciplinary idea of collaborating with people around solving problems with uh, technology and novel ideas. So I think uh, if you're not from any of the quote unquote core disciplines of technology and or management, and you're still interested in this, apply, go there, talk to people, because uh, you might bring in a very unique experience that might be very very valuable for the other team members to see things from a different perspective. Um, yeah, uh, that's basically uh, one part of it. And uh, the other one in more covering this daunting, less than 10% uh, get in uh, rate, etc. right? Really adopt a positive, a realistic, a positive mindset there. I think you may fail, but so what? You invested maybe like 20 hours in the application. Great. So accept this fact and try to create the best application possible you can. Then try to get feedback and interest. And let's be realistic. No one has the perfect CV and neither do you. And you don't need to have the perfect CV, but really try to represent everything that you did and that is relevant on there. Uh, and still, I think, be realistic in that your past experiences should to degree reflect what I said that you kind of have a match with these core values, right? That you did things that are in these domains. And if you feel like you haven't done them, look at all these amazing student initiatives that are out there, the programs that are also not just student initiatives, but also courses offered by Unternehmertum uh, 
in or outside of of uh, of the typical ECTS framework, right? So digital product school is one where I think you don't get any ECTS, but it might actually be very valuable to get all the exposure in this direction. And actions speak way, way louder than words. This is something you need to realize. Then I think put in the time into your application. Um, I probably spent personally around 20 hours at least writing and iterating my motivation letter alone for my application. And this sounds like crazy to some of you probably, but this is also sometimes what it takes to, to get in and cross this high barrier of, uh, of being invited to an interview in particular. And I showed it to several friends before I submitted it. I asked for feedback from them and then iterated it. And you can do this before the application. You need to start in advance, of course. You might also show it to other CDTM students, you know, actually ask them whether they would be able to, to give feedback on that beforehand. And if in case you haven't got in, then take your motivation and then again, go out there and try to, to ask for feedback um, and really push for that, right? So we can't test on an institutional level with 10 people. If we spend giving feedback to, or I'm not part of the team anymore, but we have been uh, 10 people, uh, we can't give detailed feedback to, especially in this first uh, hurdle of the application, but try to get feedback from alumni of the program, from people who are in it, uh, and so forth. So try to to find ways uh, to, to convince people to, to help you out on that. And uh, there's always the next semester to to try again. And I think a lot of the students that end up in the program applied more than once. This is also something you need to realize. Yeah, that's something I also say. And and I think I would really encourage people to also reach out to Center Links. I think I talked with Dimitri and, and he said like, Ali reached out to him, hey, I don't know anybody from a program, will you help me? And I think most people will at least listen to you. And, and I think that's there's this hurdle to like reach out to somebody and have feedback, but I think that's super helpful, definitely. Yeah, and you right to ask somebody to proofread your motivation that is a bit a big ask. You can start much, much smaller by going to the Inspire and Dine events, to the info events and really asking your questions there and maybe also, you know, show interest, follow up there. And I think this is how you can step by step improve what you have. 100%. Awesome. So we talked a lot about kind of you and 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 your research and CDTM, and uh, I kind of want to finish this this episode of what uh, about your podcast. Um, so it's called Entrepreneurship and Leadership, and if I can somehow link it, I will definitely do so. And I was just very interested in how did this all start? What was your motivation to do so? Oh, so uh, great, great segue also. Uh, I feel like this is going to be one of your longer episodes uh, if I now look at the time. And uh, sorry for me also giving these elaborate answers, but I think sometimes it's also interesting to understand the context around uh, those. <clears throat> so I started this uh, podcast called Entrepreneurship and Leadership. And I think part of the motiv motivation, and I prominently mentioned this in uh, the beginning of each episode, is that I want to found a startup as my next career step uh, as well. So shout out to everyone who has great ideas. I'm currently in a very open ideation space. You can also reach out to me there. And I'm super happy to connect and talk about uh, this. Um, well, instead of having many of the conversations leading up to how to found, what to found behind closed doors, I figured it would be interesting to turn this into a podcast and explore myself in the same way as a podcast host. And I think that's the entrepreneurship side. The leadership side is uh, also through uh, reflection over the past years uh, in guided programs, but also on my own. I really recognize that the topic I've been passionate or the common denominator and what I've been passionate about in many ways is leadership. What makes great leadership? What makes great leaders? Uh, and what impact can they have on teams, but also organizations? And for me personally, then also, how do I develop those skills? And I think particularly in startups, there are a lot of trade-offs you have to do or so-called leadership challenges and so forth that require careful judgment, that require you to weigh business uh, goals you might have against uh, more value-based uh, perspectives, how, how you want to create, shape the world uh, and your startups. And also, as I said earlier, right, integrity, your own personal values and so forth. So, and oftentimes dilemmas, those don't have the one good or perfect outcome, but you need to make some trade-offs, right? So focusing on these two topics seemed like the right niche for me to start out. Perfect. I think that that's uh, something which I find it really interesting that you're like, hey, I don't want to do this behind closed doors, but share it. And I think for a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs, it's going to be super helpful if you can listen to, hey, how did other people solve this mean you're 
have to like it's the solution and you just adapt it but it's nice to hear some different perspectives for sure and um so yeah kind of your 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 vision like wh where do you want to go with this podcast i think that's always interesting to hear well honestly speaking i'm treating it more as an experiment um and uh it's for, for one nice also to have a project that doesn't have this big grand vision but i'm taking it really i guess episode to to episode and at some point i will stop and re-evaluate this um just as a personal a framework for myself i've set myself the goal to do this until the end of the year and then really reevaluate to have as much fun as i expect to have the impact the listeners uh, that i expected i would have and is this worth the effort and so uh really for any listeners of my podcast or future listeners if you want to check it out i'm sure mariana will put a link into the the show notes uh this means that i'm very interested to also learn what you think and how i can adapt and improve which new guests or topics uh, you want to hear or maybe also how the format could be improved. So uh, very happy to reach out uh, and also post, if you listen on Spotify, one of these interactive Q and A's all the time that you can answer if you want. Perfect, your, your, your Spotify game is a lot better. <laughs> I haven't figured out the Q and A section yet. <laughs> oh, no, 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 I, I disagree there, right? You have video, you also have like really nice sections already in your podcast when I listened for, to, to one of them in the preparation. So. I think you're doing a pretty decent job there. And I think you are actually ahead of me in some of those things. <laughs> Thanks so much. So first, let's thank you again for kind of all the time you invested here. And I kind of want to close this off because you had so many amazing guests. So definitely check it out, um, the podcast. So what would be your three main takeaways from your episodes, which is going to be incredibly hard, I can imagine, but still the question to you. Yeah, it's a bit like the dissertation, right? So you have a lot of long form content and then you try to compress it into the three highlights. Uh, so that's difficult. And I think there's like a lot of great guests, so more than uh, I will probably mention here now. Um, but thinking about this, I think like a meta understanding is that there's no straight way to founding. And you also hear this, or I also noticed this talking to all these different kind of entrepreneurs or um are people in a startup uh, ecosystem and i think johan in his episode uh he characterized it uh that ideation is more like a drunken walk to finding your ideas you might start out aiming for one direction but then you kind of find something else interesting for some time and so you kind of go forward until you have read the idea you want to start with and my takeaway here is that it's okay if this progress in this early stage where i am at the moment it doesn't feel like I'm getting ahead really fast, but I'm looking at a lot of different topics and um, probably this just takes time. And it's more important that you have the patience there. Keep pushing, be impatient with action, right? But be patient with the result. Um, so that's one. I think another great takeaway was uh, in my episode with Maximilian from Finn um, that when he said that decisions uh, easier to make if you realize that you can walk them back and actually how easy you can often walk them back. And the topic here around which this evolved was uh, Finn's decision as a, I think they are now four years old, roughly, a very young startup from Munich, uh, to expand to the US, which at least if you look at it from the outset, this implies extended business risk, right? Extending your resources into a new market and even one that's as big as the US. So. We talked about the risk associated with this step and ultimately he reminded me that often decisions are far easier to reverse in the light of new information kind of this agile mindset also than one would think and while going to the us sounds like a big step you build your company there uh your us subsidiary in the same way that you would do so here in germany step by step right and if at some point you don't see that this has a positive outcome attached to it anymore you can actually reverse that decision without having invested too many resources. And yes, there's some reputational risk, but in the end, uh, if your business works, uh, time will time will actually tell there. Um, so that's the second one. Easiest decisions are way easier to reverse than you would normally think. And then finally, being a CEO is like playing mini games. Uh, Giza made this great analogy that stuck with me when I asked about what her job as a CEO as an early stage startup, sorry, her job as CEO at an early stage startup uh, was. So she said, one day you are playing 
the fundraising mini game another day you're playing the sales mini game and then the hiring mini game and probably it's not just one day but several days or weeks at a time but then you have to switch to an entirely different thing and i really like this analogy because it ties back to what i said in the very beginning of the podcast right so use your 20s to try out many different things and figure out what you really like and what you're good at because you know this is how you will get the experience that will also enable you to succeed in a career as diverse as entrepreneurship in the end wow thanks so much this was a great finish off uh, of, the, of the episode so thank you so much michael i loved hearing all your insights and uh, as i said i will definitely link you i think people are going to be absolutely getting a lot of value from your episodes yeah i had a great time being here and i hope also that for the listeners there was uh, some uh, nuggets and something useful there it was the first podcast and i did as a guest and uh, definitely big thank you also for inviting me here and yeah the next time i'll try or we'll <laughs> talk about the topics again in the future so i'm not uh, going over time here but uh, you now know that i give elaborate answers <laughs> i like it i like it thanks so much michael